Yesterday's talk, I kind of just uh, covered the new features of Grails 3. In this talk, we're going to take a different tack and uh, look at like some of the um, emerging uh, patterns for developing plugins and applications with Grails 3 and, and how that's um, panning out. Because the way you develop plugins and applications in Grails 3 is actually quite different. Or actually, well, let me clarify that the best practices around that are quite different. Um, before I get started, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Graham Ro Roche, uh, the Grails project lead at OCI. We are a um, full service uh, consulting, training, and support organization focused on Grails, amongst other open source technologies. Um, uh, the Grails team at OCI is growing, and uh, we, we're hiring all the time and looking to expand the team with good Grails engineers. So. Um, you can come meet the team. We have a booth uh, outside in the exhibitors hall. And um, yeah, we uh, continue to grow. So on the, on the agenda today, we're going to look at plugins, Grails and how they relate to traits, plugins and events, the new configuration API, code generation, Gradle. And we're going to do it in a kind of interactive way, trying to using code and stuff like that. I don't have a huge amount of slides. Um, so we're going to see how that works out. Uh, you know how I like live coding, so um, we'll see how that, that pans out. So we're going to build an example here. It's going to be a mail sender. We're going to use traits, events, configuration, and code generation to, to build a plugin. And uh, hopefully we come up with something cool along the way. Uh, so let's, let's get started. So plugins and traits. So for, for, for those uh, who, who don't know, does everybody know what a trait is here? So for those of you who don't, it, a trait is essentially um, like a groovy a Java 8 uh, interface with default implementation. Default. Um, so, uh, however, they have much better semantics in terms of composition in Groovy and how you can compose them and uh, delegate to super implementations and uh, a, a more robust uh, version of Java 8 default methods and interfaces uh, designed for Groovy. It's kind of like a mix-in. Uh, if that makes it any clearer. Um, so uh, we, we're going to have a go at seeing how that works. And I'm going to start by creating a brand new uh, demo application here in Grails 3. Uh, actually, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wipe that out. I'm going to make a directory called demo and see the end to that first. And I'm going to create a, um, first I'm going to create a plugin. Um, and we're going to call it, call it the mail uh, sender plugin. And then I'm going to create a application. We can just call it my app. Um, and I'm going to create a settings.gradle file that combines those two uh, Grails projects into a multi-project build. So mail sender and my app. So one of the great things about Grails 3, which I'm just demonstrating now, is it's built on Gradle. Yeah? So you can use Gradle multi-project builds to power the, uh, when you have a suite of plugins, you can build them each individually and compose them into your main, main application. So that's essentially what I'm doing here. Uh, in my application build.gradle, I can add a dependency in here on my plugin project, which is in a completely separate project by using this syntax here. There we go. And with all that done, we can open up uh, IntelliJ. I'm just using the community edition here. And we can import this project uh, by pointing at the settings.gradle. Yeah? So I just point my ID at settings.gradle, click OK, and we will get our uh, fully multi-project build structured up and running. Yeah. So this is a bit of a, I went to do, didn't want to start it off with a boilerplate project. I want to actually create this from scratch to show you that this is actually a great feature. Uh, the fact that you can have these multi-project builds. Um, so, and if you, if you uh, seed into the Maya app directory, uh, oops, sorry, just seed Maya, and I run, for example, from here, Gradle W, um, Assemble, 
to build my Gradle project, you'll see that it's building my plugin first because um, my project depends on, you know, I, I'm sure there's a lot of Gradle uh, talks that will explain these concepts way better than I do. But because it's a dependency of my project, it's get built part of my project. So let's get on to actual traits. So um, essentially, um, I'm going to synchronize this. When I created my um, mail sender plugin, we still have, just like in Grails 2, you have each plugin has a Grail sender, Grails plugin uh, descriptor, except now it's in the source main directory. So this is my plugin descriptor, and you can populate that with information if you want. Unlike in Grails 2, you don't have to specify the version in, the, in here. That gets supplied by your build.gradle. So uh, it's just a, another source file. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new Groovy class here that is a mail sender. Uh, we, we just have uh, defined it as class initially. And I'm going to change, change the keyword to being a trait. Yeah, so this is now a, a trait, and um, it's going to use a, another interface called, which we're just making up for the purposes of this demo, called mail system. And the mail system is going to have a send mail method that takes a mail message, and uh, oops, it's it's an interface, of course, and sends that message. Yeah. So the cool thing about traits here yeah, is uh, they get compiled into your classes, yeah? And they can have static methods, they can have properties, uh, they can have instance methods, they can have all sorts of things. So, and they can also use annotations and everything. So I can actually say uh, auto-wide mail system, yeah? So to get a, get a hold of, of a reference to my, I'm going to say required equals false because I'm going to create a default implementation. And this will mean that if the mail system object is a spring bean, it'll get auto-wide into my trait, yeah? And then I'm going to supply a send mail method that uh, takes a map um, of, uh, that is the message. And, um, we're going to do mail system dot send mail new simple mail message, which is just part of the Spring Mail API, <coughs> and send that. Okay, <coughs> so that's pretty cool. Um, we've got a, a mail sender trait that sends to our mail uh, system. The mail system could be backed onto uh, SendGrid or anything that or you know, a Java mail or, any, you know, it could be anything. Uh, we have an interface in between that. Uh, let's write some tests to make sure that we actually, this actually make, does work. So let's create a new package called mail.sender and create a new mail sender spec. And this is going to be a Spoc specification. And let's test out, and we're going to create a little uh, class that uh, just, we'll just call it um, test mailer that implements my mail sender trait. Yeah, pretty simple. So um, the test goes something like this, test that we can send mail. And uh, given a uh, new a mailer. Let's create one of these. Equals new test mailer. Um, we're gonna essentially set the. Um, oops, the wrong error. Set the mail system to a mock, mock version provided by Spock. Yeah. Um, let's get that mock into a variable. So when a mail is sent, uh, and we're essentially going to do test.sendmail uh, to Fred from Bob, then we expect 
that a male is sent. When, well, when send mail is called. So that, in that, when this happens, we expect one call to the mock uh, send mail method that, ex that receives a simple mail message uh, with to Fred and from Bob. Okay, so let's, let's run that and see what happens. Oops, we, uh, that should be a then, not an expect, when then. Um, okay, so we have a passing test that exercises our, our trait. We are got, we've got our mail sender trait. So that's pretty cool. We can Im immediately start using this then. Um, for example, if we go into my application here, uh, we're in my app and we start up a Grails interactive console. Um, we can uh, do create controller demo. Let's create a demo controller. So this is in my actual my app project, yeah. And what we can do in here is we can say this demo controller uh, implements mail sender, implements the mail sender trait, and now. Uh, we can just call send mail to Fred from Bob and uh, mail sent. Yeah. Uh, so our, our object, our demo controller immediately becomes uh, a mail sender, which is pretty cool. Uh, we can verify this by actually writing a, a test for our demo controller. So again, not actually dissimilar to our previous specification. So I'm going to uh, copy this and just stick it in here, just that our controller can send email. So given a, um, in this case, we are going to um, set the mail system on the controller and test, test that my controller can send mail. Um, and Let's see what that does. Um, let's run this test action fact. No such property test. Whoops, this is called. We actually have to do controller slash dot index because the index action is going to actually what sends the email. There we go, test passing. So my controller is now a mail sender trait, which is pre pretty cool. Um, but let's make this even more interesting. So now this is a, this is a plugin, obviously. Plugins can do more than, um, than just provide classes. I mean, that trait is just a jar file, of course. So what if we wanted all controllers to be mail senders in our plugin here? Yeah? That's a reasonable requirement. Uh, so let's get rid of the implements mail sender definition here. So we, we don't have a reliance on that, that particular trait interface in our controller itself. Um, and let's open up our mail sender trait. Yeah? And what we can do is in Grails, there's an annotation called enhances. We specify enhances, and we say controller artifact handler dot type. So we want we want to enhance all the different controllers. Yeah, that's what I'm saying in, by this definition. Um, I specified that there, and now if we run our test again, let's see what happens. There you go, test passing, yeah? So just by adding this line saying, I enhance controllers in our plugin, all of our controllers in our application are now mail senders, yeah? Of course, we're operating against a interface here. Uh, so how would you provide an implementation of that, yeah? So remember, we've got this order wide thing up here. So what you can actually do is uh, in your plugin, 
we can come to our implementation here and we can create a new uh, default mail system, for example. And this is going to implement the ma mail system interface. And it's going to implement the send mail method. And we're going to just print line saying sending mail message. And that's all good. Now, so how do we get register this? How do we register this implementation with the application? You know, from our plugin. Well, let's open up our mail sender Grails plugin. And what you have here is just like in Grails 2, a do with spring block. So what we can say that the mail system is a default mail system. And now, whenever we our plugin is used, um, this will be auto wired into all of our controllers. This implementation, because we specified it as a Spring Bean in the do with Spring block. Yeah. So let's verify this by actually running this application and see what, seeing what happens when we hit the index action. So in, the, in my tests, I was using that mocked out Spock implementation, but now in the actual production version of our way lights, we don't need lights. I look better in the dark. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so let's uh, open up Safari and hit our local host. Hit our action, mail sent, sending mail printed to the console. Yeah? So our, our default implementation provided by the plugin, which I registered through my plugin in here in the do with spring, should I change it to a white background? Would that be better? Yes, let's try that. Uh, instead of Dracula, we'll try the default. Wait. Uh, do I have to restart? Okay. That's bright. Okay. Or not. Uh, I, I think, yeah, it's the editor. Let's have a look. Uh, follows it, drag big, default, supply. Well, but that's small. Okay, save as, copy. Font. Way bigger. Okay. Better? Okay, excellent. Um, so as you can see, uh, a plugin can provide both behavior through traits, but also through integration with Spring and auto wiring can provide implementations through the Grails plugin class that are then overridable by your application. So your application can provide its own mail system bean that overrides the default one from the plugin. Yeah, you see the the power of how traits mixed with um, the en uh, enhances annotation and the plugin system in Grails allows you to compose behavior. It's pretty powerful. Uh, we're going to explore this more as we get through the demo. So keep key initial points then. Use enhances to add. Uh, you can use enhances to add behavior. Uh, in, that, in that case, I've specified a string, but there's a bunch of constants in Grails um, for the various um, values of enhan enhances. Um, and uh, you can essentially register methods or add traits to your existing controllers and the main classes. All very powerful. And the whole internal uh, workings of Grails 3 operates like this. So no longer does Grails 3 um, do any metaprogramming at startup time to configure behavior. It's all compiled in to your classes. And because it's all compiled in, it's all referenced uh, usable through compile static and and all those uh, nice Groovy features of Groovy 2.4. Uh, so we have a bunch of uh, core traits uh, that uh, ship out of the box. So uh, it might be interesting to have a look at these. I'll show you some of these in the source code. The controller trait is implemented by all controllers. It's pretty 
you know, self-explanatory, the domain class trait is divided by the domain classes. We have a special trait for domain classes that are also GORM entities, because they don't have to be. Uh, the service trait, tag library, interceptor, the events trait, which we'll, I'm going to cover in more detail now. Uh, let's have a look at some of these, because uh, it might be interesting to see how the internals of Grails are now uh, structured. So, for example, if we open up the controller trait, uh, you can see that a controller um, implements a whole bunch of other traits. So this is the controller trait. Uh, and what's interesting about this is if we open up the tag library trait, uh, which is another trait that all tag libraries implement in GSP, you can see that many of the same traits that controller implements including web attributes, servlet attributes, and tag library invoker are also implemented by um, controllers, yeah? So um, uh, the other nice thing about this is if you're ever wondering, like in previous versions of Grails, when you wanted to see the implementation of the render method or the respond method, or you had to go and like find a bit of metaprogramming in Grails that added that method, um, now, you know, if, if I'm looking at my controller and I want to find out how uh, the, I don't know, the uh, redirect method works, for example, we have it here defined in the trait, yeah? So we can, we can see the implementation. It's just defined as normal method. Um, and uh, that's pretty handy. Uh, in fact, uh, this is actually a good example of how powerful traits are because the redirect method is actually being overridden uh, by, and there's a super implementation which is actually from response re redirector. So there's a trait called response redirector which knows how to redirect responses. Um, why is there a response redirector trait? Well, because the interceptor trait, uh, interceptors are a new feature of Grails 3. Also, uh, that's not the one. Yeah, that's the one. The interceptor trait also implements, um, as you can see there, also implements uh, response redirector, yeah? Uh, as well as response renderer, request forwarder, and a whole bunch of other traits. So interceptors and controllers share a lot of common functionality that are weaved in via traits, yeah? And in fact, you can define your own classes um, in your project that reuse some of the, so if, if you want to define a response redirector, it might, might be a valid use case, or a request forwarder, or a response renderer, uh, you could implement these traits in your classes and create different components that behave differently or do different things. And so it's, it's much more flexible and much more powerful. We, uh, you know, all of the behavior is not defined in one place. Uh, we have this composition through traits. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty neat way to structure the project and the APIs. It's far easier to read the APIs, reference the APIs just through your normal IDE um, without having to look for a particular piece of metaprogramming that added that method or, or anything like that. So uh, much better in Grails 3. OK, uh, so let's talk about events now. So events are a key part of Grails 3 and the Grails 3 um, architecture as well. Um, events are built on top of Project Reactor. Uh, Reactor is a, um, is a um, uh, framework that allows for reactive programming and control of back pressure and all those good things that uh, that are coming out of the, the reactor. Um, it implements the um, reactive stream spec. And uh, essentially, it defines also an API for uh, consuming and firing events, which Grails leverages significantly. Um, events are important when you consider Grails' plugin system. Yeah? If you want to create decoupled systems through plugins, events are a fantastic way to achieve that. So. Um, Let's see how this, this could be, can be done um, by extending my example here. So we've got our mail sender plugin. Um, so wouldn't it be nice um, that if, um, you know, uh, instead of uh, actually uh, blocking and sending the mail in here, that we issued an event 
that you know got consumed by something else, and um, uh, and that which actually dealt with sending the email. Yeah. So uh, so what we can do here is in my default mail system we can implement the events trait. Yeah. And in the mail system, we can define a interface here. We can define a constant uh, called send event, which uh, we can define as a, a string. Uh, you can use any kind of matching uh, with Reactor in, ter in terms of keying events. Strings are happen to be convenient but you can key in on a class or, or anything like that in terms of naming events. Um, uh, Reactor has a whole bunch of uh, features around, a score, around selectors and matching via regular expressions or all sorts of things. Uh, as it happens for the purposes of this demo, I'm gonna use this, uh, a, a string because it's, it clarifies the example easily. Just, just be aware that um, the actual naming of events and consuming of events and how those uh, events are selected for notification is completely flexible. So um, I've implemented the uh, events trait here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call notify and I'm going to use the uh, send event and, part, and create an event for my me uh, message. So essentially what's gonna happen here is uh, when, um, when this comes in, um, when this, when this um, message gets sent, we trigger a notify event which goes into Reactor and the de default Reactor uh, dispatcher in Grails is a thread pool dispatcher, which you can configure to the number of threads that you want. Uh, so it's completely asynchronous and non-blocking. And uh, now all we have to do is listen on to said event. Um, so, so how do we achieve that? Let's have a look. So now, now my plugin is firing an event. Let us create a, in my application, um, so in my application we wanna create some kind of custom um, my app object, for example, and uh, new mail listener, for example, I'm gonna call it, call it. And there are essentially two ways to do this. I'm gonna demonstrate you the, the first way. Uh, there is another alternative way, uh, which is around using annotations. Um, but what I'm gonna do is here, I'm gonna register a post construct um, method here called init and uh, my mail listener is also going to implement the events object events trait um, and what I'm going to do is uh, when the uh, on the mail mail system dot send event I am going to receive an event which is going to be our mail contain our mail message. There we go. Um, so we're going to receive an event that's going to contain our mail message, and we're actually going to do the mail sending, uh, which we're not. But anyway, uh, let me import that. Yeah, it's going to be a Reactor Boss event. Uh, got event. which we're just going to output the, the data. Then uh, I'm going to open up my application class from my app application. And uh, another great thing about Grails 3 is the application class is um, implements the Grails application uh, lifecycle interface. Um, so the Grails application lifecycle interface is also the same interface that's implemented by plugins. So all the different plugin hooks available to plugins are also available to applications. So I can override, for example, do with spring in here and uh, register my uh, mail listener mean. And that will result in my um, mail listener being created in my spring context. And it'll essentially listen for those events. 
well, that's the theory anyway. Let's, uh, let's have a look what actually happens. <laughs> or if it does. Hold thumbs. Yeah. Startup, uh, how about when you uh, wrap it as a war file? You think in the application that does that get executed as well? Yes, absolutely. Uh, everything that happens in the application happens in loading the war file. Uh, yeah? Really interested in that. Um, why is that uh, uh, need to be defined? Uh, if you put it in the service folder, services folder. Yeah, so I could have created a service. Uh, so. Um, Services actually implement the events trait, but I wanted to demonstrate. I, I wanted to demonstrate the um, fact that you don't have to be tied to Grails of specific artifacts. So I'm going to. Do, I'm doing it as just a normal component that you register as a bean, but you can just you can just as easily do it in a service. So yeah. Then the trait. Yeah. Oh, the, uh, you don't even have to implement the trait because the trait is already implemented by services. It's one of the default traits implemented by services. Yeah. So events is implemented by controllers and services already. Yeah. Uh, I'll clarify that in my slides uh, that, that are coming. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, but the, the point is, is like the, the events trait is something that you can reuse in your in your own code. Yeah. Uh, of course, you get to use it in controllers and services, and it's out of the box. But you know, I'm showing you that you know you've got complete power of control of the event system and what implements it and when they're fired and everything. So you can see it did work. I sent my mail. I got my event. Uh, all is well. Yeah. So in my actual event, I would actually implement my logic that called out to SendGrid or uh, you know if you're in the cloud to send to send my email or um, Mailgun or you know one of those those APIs. Or use Java Mail, or you know whatever you do actually do use for you. Maybe you don't even have a maybe you have a custom system that stores them in the database and then batches them up later on. I don't know. Uh, you implement whatever whatever mail system you want. But Grails gives you the complete control of that. Okay, so uh, so yeah, events. Any class that implements the events trait can send and receive events. Um, do you? As, as I was telling you before, the controllers and services uh, types implement uh, the trait, uh, traits by default, in the events trait by default. You can, using this event-driven approach, you, you can see how I can decouple my application from my plugin and create decoupled systems that uh, are reactive. Um, events are built on top of the reactive framework. So, um, and use the, the thread pool dispatcher from Reactor, which is completely configurable in your Grails application. Um, immensely powerful, this. Uh, you can, there's essentially three main entry points in the events trait API. You got the on um, method, uh, and the note for, risk for consuming an event, and the notify message for sending an event. Um, the on method, in these examples on this slide, as I both methods t um, take actually any object um, as the key. I'm just using strings because that's illustrative, but you can use selectors, you can use regex, you can use a whole bunch of things to match events by certain patterns. Or There's also a send and receive event if you want, to, if you want uh, to your, the calling object to receive a response from, instead of just notify, which is like fire and forget you want a response to come back. The response that comes back is like a callback style. So you, you pass it to closure and you get, so it's all non-blocking. Um, pretty, uh, pretty cool stuff. And you can also use annotations. Again, I didn't demonstrate this, but you, on, on, this is an example on a server. There's a consumer annotation and a selector annotation. Uh, these are from Spring Reactor and you can add those to your services and or your service methods uh, and get them to listen to and register for events. So pretty powerful stuff. Okay, so um, we've got this far. We're building our plugin, but we want to be able to like configure the plugin. Yeah, the mail sender plugin. So what do plugins offer? What does Grails and plugins offer? 
when it comes to configuration. So one of the things you might want to set, and this is purely illustrative, is, um, I don't know, the hosts that you're of the mail server, let's just, you know, uh, make this up. Uh, and we can have a, another constant in here that is our mail.host.setting or something like that. Let's call it that. Um, and uh, so in our, in, our, uh, in our implementation here, we can, there's a couple of things you can do. You can use springs at value to, uh, to try and look up a, an instance of um, what's essentially, um, you can use a, a spring expression there to, to look up this, the setting and, it, and use what's called configuration injection. So that, that's one option that you, that you, have, to, you have. Another option, which is quite interesting, is um, we can come into my um, mail sender plugin here. And in the application.yaml file, which I'm going to reduce to um, reduce the content of because a lot of this stuff is like not really necessary for the plugin, is what we can do is um, specify the mail.host what did I call it again? Host dot setting. Um, let's just call it mail dot host. Uh, equals by default local host. So what's the significance of putting it in the application dot yaml in the plug plugin? The significance of that is that becomes the default value. Yeah. If your application doesn't define another value, that is going to be the value of that property. Yeah. In application dot yaml. Then um, in our mail uh, sender grails plugin, uh, when we're registering our bean here, we can, for example, get hold of a reference to the config object and use get property to get hold of, of the mail system dot host. Uh, what, was I, what did I call it again? Is that what I call it? Oh God. Host setting. There it is, uh, and set the host. So we can use uh, the DSL within the plugin. So why is this kind of, why would you do this and not use add value? Well, this has some nice added benefits um, around, uh, there's various arguments here. For example, if this was a Boolean value, we could automatically convert it to a Boolean. And if it wasn't possible to convert to a Boolean, it would be null. Um, the other thing you get is default values. So this could be true or false. Um, you can also use the config object to dynamically pass out certain settings, configuration values that are you know, not just static uh, properties. There's a whole bunch of other uses that, um, so in many cases, add value will probably do what you want. But in other cases, you may want to dynamically configure this variable to be something. Um, so the config API allows that, and this config object is an, imp an instance of config, which also implements map, but it also implements the property resolver interface from Spring, which allows you to reference um, there's various useful methods like get required property, where it will throw an exception if it's not found, uh, for converting from, uh, from to and from specific types. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's pretty pretty handy. Um, so if I then, so this would be my default value. If I came to my uh, Grails application and specified something else in here uh, to be blah, something else, somewhere else, uh, that would override the value from the plugin. Yeah. So if you had two separate plugins that both defined it and then it didn't. So Grails has a plugin manager interface and a plugin can uh, request to be loaded before or after a specific plugin. So you ha if you have two, you say, say you've got, um, I don't know, the mail plugin and you want your mail sender plugin to load after that plugin to make sure that it overrides whatever that plugin, you can orchestrate and control the order of plugin loading. Uh, um, and you can also do that at the application level. Uh, there are ways to control um, plugin load order. Uh, there, the plugin manager has a plugin finder interface. You can filter up existing plugins. So you have complete control over how that, that, that operates. 
Okay, uh, so the configuration API, very useful if you're developing uh, Grails plugins and applications. Again, not all settings are just flat uh, settings. You, you could ask for, a, instead of a Boolean, you could ask for a map, or you could ask for, a, you could, you, if, if the object comes from a, a, an application.groovy file and it's a closure, you could ask for a closure, for example. So, um, or you can use that value, which uh, is, is fine for simple cases. Uh, just add a value, and as long as your, your uh, object is a um, spring bean, spring will inject that using config configuration injection. Uh, the other thing about the configuration API is that Grails 3 builds on top of Spring's uh, property sources concept. So um, you essentially have an inheritable list of property sources, uh, one of them being application.yaml, one of them being the plugin. Uh, the application.yaml is loaded after the plugin so that it, it gets overridden. But you also have, uh, you can override by system properties or by environment variables. So it's completely, um, com completely flexible. Uh, okay. Um, as I said, applications inherit from plugin configurations. You, you should keep your plugin configurations minimal because you may remember that you might have many plugins and you don't want them all to have like a full, full application.yaml. Um, plugin configuration defines the default values and applications can override those. So let's talk about, about code generation. I'm not going to go into a demo of this, this, but it's also uh, a key part of uh, Grails 3. Um, I'm going to walk you through some examples of how code generation is done in Grails 3. Um, so, um, so essentially, uh, we have a DSL for code generation. And if you look at the Grails 3 scaffolding plugin, for example, uh, a plugin uh, can define a source main scripts directory. And in there, um, a plugin can uh, essentially uh, define Groovy scripts that are um, just camel case names, so create scaffold controller, for example. Um, and this is what that looks like. So if we look at our terminal uh, here, I'm going to stop the application. If I tab, you can see there's a over here, there is a create uh, scaffold controller command. Now this, this is, the implementation of this is essentially here. Okay, whatever. Um, uh, this is the implementation and you can see it's got a description. It's a DSL for creating these commands. Uh, so why has it got a description? Well, um, if you ask uh, Grails for help, for example, on the create scaffold controller command, if you, it'll, all that information will get pulled from, from this description. Uh, you can also enforce certain arguments to be required. You can provide completers for tab completion. Um, you can provide different, different flags. For example, the cre create scaffold controller um, has a force flag, um, which will only come after you've uh, essentially specified a, a particular controller name. Um, and then another interesting part of this is the model method. Um, so the model method will take the argument that you specify, which is essentially a string called, for example, foo, and it will return an instance of the model interface. So what is, what is the model interface? Uh, it's essentially grails.cogen.model. And this provides you an API for introspecting the conventions. So you have the class name, that was evaluated from the argument, the full name, the package name, the path to the package, the simple name, the property name, what it is in lowercase. Uh, this convention method is particularly interesting because if, if you're, um, if you're uh, say for example, you do create controller, um, foo controller, the controller suffix at the end is like the convention. So Grails can split out what is, that, what is the convention and what is not the convention. And, Ensure you don't create something like foo controller controller, or <laughs> if you see what I'm saying. Um, and then we have a separate API for template rendering. So you'll see in the scaffolding plugin that there is a reference to a template here. That template um, 
is found uh, within the source main templates directory. There it is. And it's referenced here in Grails. Grails will automatically deal with the fact that um, looking for it on the class path or looking for it for in, in your source main scripts directory and deal with the consistency of that. And then um, you can specify a destination and you can see how we're using the model, the model object to evaluate what the package would be, or the, where the file should be generated to. Um, we're using the convention method to make sure that you don't get controller controller or ensuring that the, the naming is consistent. And then when we're passing that model into our template, and if you look at the template itself, you can see that it references the model object for, to obtain the package name, the class name inside the template itself. Um, so the code, we have a formalized code generation API. And these scripts themselves, they all um, subclass Groovy script command, uh, which is not going to be available here because it is um, not an application dependency. Groovy script command. So all of these scripts subclass this Groovy script command. And this provides, uh, for example, that render method is, a, is, a, is an interface called template renderer. There's an API for file system interaction. And uh, there are some useful objects in here. For example, the Gradle variable allows you to use method missing to invoke any Gradle command. So you can do gradle.compile-groovy, and it will run the gradle-compile-groovy target. Or you can do gradle.assemble, uh, and it will run assemble first. So you can interact with Gradle from your script, your code gen scripts, uh, just through the Gradle variable. Yeah. So you you can essentially script Gradle from these scripts if you want. Um, you got access to an ant, an ant builder if you want, um, and uh, various other useful things. So uh, the you may be creating a plugin that requires for convenience for you to generate some artifacts into your target project. And this is, this is the enabler for that. Um, so let's just to summarize code generation. Uh, so code generation scripts, uh, they differ greatly from Grails 2 because code gener you know, in Grails 2 we had a custom build system and they were essentially part of the build system. In this case, they are uh, Groovy scripts um, that can delegate to Gradle but, but they do not, do not have access to um, any of your project classes or anything. And we'll, we'll talk about how to deal with that in a minute. But they essentially, all of them, they, they, uh, they subclass the Groovy script command class. You've got those handy properties, the Gradle one for invoking Gradle. Um, there's also a method missing implementation. So if I were to do um, call a method called uh, create scaffold controller and pass it a, an argument, from another script, you can essentially invoke, invoke different cogen scripts from each other. Um, so uh, there is an example of that somewhere um, in the Grails views plugin. Uh, no, it's in the GitHub Grails profile repository, profiles, web API. So profiles can also provide commands. Uh, that's why I'm showing you this. So if we look at generate all from the, the, the um, web API profile, you can see that the generate all command calls generate controller and generate views. Yeah? So code generation scripts can call each other uh, by just invoking a method. Yeah? So that's, that's pretty handy. Um, what else? So yeah, model, the model method uh, returns a model uh, which allows you to evaluate conventions and uh, intelligently generate code into your project uh, if you need to. And we have this DSL for code generation scripts um, that makes it easy to, um, to create, uh, to define these scripts and also to get, take advantage of tab completion in interactive mode, if you provide the right uh, description uh, in terms of defining your flags and arguments to your command, you get tab completion in interactive mode, and it's easy to render templates. We deal with all the class path issues. So uh, it's a pretty nice DSL. So while we're on the topic of the shell, 
one thing you might want to do is um, in Grails, uh, in Grails 2, it was possible to load up a Grails application inside of a, a code generation script or inside of a script, a Gantt script, essentially. That is no longer possible in Grails 3. So how do you, how do, you do that in Grails 3? Um, so say I want to write a command that, uh, that performs some batch inserts or sets up my database or you know, does something. So in, in Grails uh, 3, there is a new way to do that. So for example, uh, say I want to, uh, let's create a, in my plugin here, I'm going to create a new uh, Groovy class called um, batch mail, um, it's called send batch mail or something. Let's call it that. And this is going to implement the application command. And that's the grails.dev.commands trait. And it's going to implement the handle method. Um, hopefully, IntelliJ will soon uh, not underline red when it should um, in IntelliJ 15. That's coming. <laughs> Um, so, and this is essentially going to, it's an application command and we get a hold of the application um, execution context. Uh, you can return true or false depending if the command succeeded or not. Um, and from, the, from here we can get a reference to the application context. So I can get hold of our mail uh, system, for example, get hold of our mail system and I can say mail system dot send mail, new simple message uh, to Fred from Bob. So maybe you've got a big, big bunch of batch sending mail activity to happen or, or something. Uh, save that. And now um, I'm going to just uh, drop out of my application briefly um, and CD up back back up to my mail sender project. And I'm the reason I have to do this is because I need, in order for Gradle to be able to see this, it, it needs to be in my Maven cache. Um, so I'm going to install this project into my Maven cache. And then in my application, what I'm going to do is add to my build class path. So this is my build class path. Not my, not my project class path, my build class path. I'm going to add my org.rails.plugins.mailsender0.1 snapshot. So that's essentially the details of my mail sender plugin, and the, the group and the version and, and everything. Uh, so now uh, let's, just, let's just double check that that actually my actually does resolve. Yeah, we look, it looks like we're okay. So now if we start up interactive mode, let's see what we have. And let's tap. What do we have? Um, send. Ah, hold on. Clean. Rails. Oh, I'm in the wrong project. That, that makes sense. Damn. Opened up the wrong interactive mode. I'll just do it clean, clean just before. Okay. Load this up. Oh, what have I done? I've broken something. My YAML is broken. When did I break my YAML? My app. I was fiddling with my YAML, wasn't I? Oh, I get rid of that. Yeah. I was using Groovy <laughs> logic instead of. OK. I broke my YAML at some point. <laughs> yeah. I hate breaking my YAML. OK. Uh, so if we type now, we have a, uh, we should have. What did I call my call? Send batch command. It's not there. Um, hmm. You're not in the application directory. 
Am I? Yeah. So it should be there. Or maybe I edited the wrong build or Is that what I did? Uh, yeah, send it not point one. Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. What have I done wrong? Done something wrong. Ah. Uh, let's see. Compile mail sender. Uh, let me just check if my actual mail sender is actually getting sub. Yeah, I might have clean. I might have cleaned that out. Hold on. Let's install that again. So essentially we should have, Grails does some magic to make sure that our uh, application command gets into the grails.factories file. So I've installed that locally. Now, uh, if I just do clean, And open this up. Oh, you know we have something more uh, accurate. Fail to apply. Unable to load application command factories. Yeah, so this is more accurate. Um, yeah, that's probably needs to go the other way around. I'm guessing. No. Okay. Well, anyway, normally <laughs> when you uh, when you load this up, uh, basically uh, it'll create a command in your interactive mode that essentially will allow uh, you to send. I can type grails send batch mail here, yeah? and it will call out to Gradle, build my application, load it, and run that command. Yeah, so that is the idea, but I've obviously messed up some part of the demo here. But anyway, essentially that that is what you do. So um, you can essentially create uh, Gradle tasks by implementing handle batch command. Uh, implements application command. Uh, you don't necessarily have to know any Gradle to do that, which is like in terms of being able to write your own tasks. Gradle will handle, handle all the wiring together for you. And uh, you just add them to your build.gradle uh, build class path. Uh, and uh, as long as uh, your class path is set up correctly, which mine clearly isn't uh, right now, It'll add it to your interactive mode, um, uh, interactive mode uh, output, and it'll also add a Gradle task to your project that will, you will. So you can either execute the command um, in Gradle style. So you can say Gradle batch send email, or you can say Gradle batch send email. Um, either way, it's going to end up loading your application up, giving your your command a reference to the application context where you can implement whatever logic that you want. Yeah? So that's, that's the way it works. Yeah? OK, so um, uh, in, in summary then, uh, Grail3 uh, provides um, a lot of powerful techniques uh, to build plugins that empower your application so you can create multi-project uh, builds that essentially 
build your plugins in your application together. Yeah, so you still have all the power of, uh, you know, if you've invested in plugins before and structuring your application in terms of plugins, uh, you can continue to do that. Uh, you've got uh, the core philosophy that we always promoted before, which was about, um, you know, using plugins to structure your applications. And what we like to call them nowadays is essentially like modular monoliths, yeah? Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, you can, it means you, you can modularize your application and you can run parts of it. So I could run just, just the, uh, the plugin part or, or, or I could run my whole application as a single unit. Yeah, so you've got both use cases covered. And this is very applicable in like the microservices world. You might want to write multiple sub projects that are each a microservice. Yeah, um, each, each provide a REST API, or you might want to put pull those all together into one monolithic application that you can deploy. Yeah, you have that flexibility to choose uh, how or you want to create and how you want to deploy your application. Yeah, yeah, it's immensely. And if you remember that uh, the demo from the, the keynote, you know, that, um, that plugin I added to my class path, which was a fantastic plugin written by a community called Actuator UI. That plugin I just added to my class path um, and it provided a full UI, uh, including, you know, views, controllers, potentially services, uh, static assets, yeah and full UI into my application, yeah? So you can ship a complete application as a plugin and add it to your existing uh, application that gets orchestrated and included into the, into the application. And we have a whole bunch of um, APIs uh, which make it possible to uh, override parts of your, your, the plugin, yeah? So if a plugin defines, for example, a foo controller and you are not particularly happy with a particular aspect of the foo controller. You can define one in your application. Uh, maybe you just want to subclass it and override a method, or maybe you want to, I don't know, complete, provide a completely different implementation for a backend service. For a, you, you just define a service with the same name, yeah, in your application, and it will override uh, the, the artifact from the plugin. This also works um, effectively for views, yeah? So if you define a, um, so let's say in your, your controller, you've got a show slash, uh, a book slash show dot GSP, and that comes from a plugin. You're not happy with that particular view, or you want to customize it. Uh, you just override the view in your application. Uh, the layout could still be inherited from the plugin. The templates could still be inherited from the plugin, but you can continue to build your application. Uh, it even works for static assets. So if you are you know, making the move to single page application frameworks, you can use asset pipeline to serve those assets in your Grails application, which is great because you get gzipping, you get optimized uh, assets. Um, but in your, if, if, the, if, the, if you package those as a plugin, and pull that into your application. So uh, say a, a, a set of Angular controllers and assets and, and some backend um, REST services, yeah? You can still, in your actual application, override any, any, any JavaScript by asset pipeline that is inherited from the plugin, yeah? So asset pipeline is also a, a key part of that. And, um, uh, and yeah, the, the, the plugin and modular philosophy is, is critical. Also, you've seen that um, through traits uh, and events, you, you can compose systems in Grails 3 that are um, reactive and, um, and, and extensible and modular. Traits uh, allow you to combine um, behaviors inside your services, controllers, and artifacts uh, from logic that potentially is provided by other plugins. Compose your application of those behaviors. You, uh, and, uh, and events allow you to decouple um, your, your logic uh, through reactive, in a reactive event system. So, um, and we're working to improve a lot of these areas as well. In, for example, in the Grails 3 event system, uh, one of the challenges is, is when you fire an event, for example, if that event is running inside 
a transaction, then um, uh, or, or the caller is running inside a transaction, then the event will likely get fired outside the boundaries of the transaction. So we're looking at ways to extend uh, in Grails 3 and have transactional events participate in the, in the whole transaction. Yeah, uh, they're called uh, transaction send events or something. Uh, so uh, we're working on area, ways to Im improve that and make that all work nicely. And of course, what the, the events will continue to play a, a huge role in um, in uh, in the reactive solution we come up with in in Grails 3.2 in terms of um, uh, building on Netty and providing a, a lower memory consumption profile for building applications, uh, which we're looking at doing in 2016. And the other key thing is that you know we've taken a lot of lessons learned from uh, Grails 2 uh, days and applied those uh, those those that knowledge that le learning that we've gained and all of the internals of Grails are written using these techniques. Yeah. So you've seen there how I showed you like the controller tra controller trait, how it's composed of multiple other traits, and we see this uh, flowing throughout the, ho the whole um, uh, uh, throughout all of Grails, and it's one of, it's one of the areas actually that also makes it challenging to just accept plugin up upgrades as is, because so many plugins use older techniques like uh, that could be improved uh, by using some of these newer techniques. Uh, the older techniques still work, so we're not saying you know if you if you if you have a, a particular plugin that does a lot of meta programming you know, that, that's still going to continue to work. Um, but there are better ways to do things now, and we encourage you to, to take a look at those and check them out, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, they give you some food for for thought. Um, okay, so I have a, left quite a bit of time for Q and A. Um, questions? Yeah. As far as a default configuration for plugins go, does, is that to say that we could uh, supply a default configuration for another plugin like Spring Security, say in our domain plugin, and have those be the defaults for our different web applications that include that domain plugin? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, the question is could you provide default configuration for another plugin? And yeah, absolutely, you could uh, define your own uh, security plugin that depended on Spring Security, that defined the config exactly the configuration that you wanted um, as the default for every new project, and that only needs like tweaking uh, by your, your developers. Uh, so that's absolutely a valid, valid use case. Um, or you know, there's a whole bunch of use cases for that in terms of you know, just having a default config for your project. Uh, so that's a, that's a great idea. Well, you want to go first? Is it possible to enhance uh, tests like we enhance uh, other classes using the So the question is, is it possible to enhance tests um, like you can? Absolutely. Uh, so we, we know our, our, our existing testing, unit testing API, you know, the test mix and annotation, that predates traits. Um, but we don't want to go and just like break all of that again. So, um, <laughs> so, um, uh, but that's not to say that you know a better version of that API could develop, could be developed, and most certainly could be developed with uh, with traits. Traits support um, annotations on met on methods, so you can annotate like um, before and after, and and get that to work with both JUnit and Spock um, quite trivially. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of potential there. You could you could add a um, you know custom uh, could even add custom test runners and stuff like that using that technique. So um, and you could probably more effectively allow the ability to compose different traits because um, you know if you the ordering of the trait that you, the implements clause defines which trait wins in terms of the implementation. So you could control uh, better. Um, like overrides and so on. So yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Yeah, you had a question. Does the way that that enhances, uh, does that work with compiled data? Yeah, or, so the, or yes, so the question is, when you use enhances, does that use work with compiled static? 
And the answer is yes, it does work with compile static. Um, and um, in, uh, also in IntelliJ 15, they've got its built-in support for that. So that, that when, it's, uh, when it comes out at the end of the year, you'll get code completion for all of those as well. Um, so how it actually works, just a little background, and actually this is probably what, something worth showing, is um, we have an AST transform. That, that is actually an AST transform um, the, the, at the enhancer's annotation. And what, is it, what it does is it generates in the classes directory this grails.factories file. Yeah? This file here. So it's something internal to grails. You don't have to worry about it. It's generated. Yeah? This, and this file gets, goes into your plugin jar file. And you can see in here that uh, you can see two things here. You can see I've got a trait injector defined, which is the mail sender trait injector. The mail sender trait injector is a class that is created on the fly by the AST transform. Um, and it essentially, all it does is define uh, the fact that the mail sender trait, um, mail sender trait, where is it? Uh, the mail sender trait should be injected into controllers. Yeah. Grails will then scan the class path for these grails.factories files during compilation and pick them up dynamically, and these uh, traits will get wired into your, your classes using that technique. So that's how it works. If you want to get into the, you know, the detail of the implementation, that's how it actually, uh, actually happens. Uh, and the same thing, the, the grails.factories file is actually used for a, a whole bunch of things, uh, including, uh, as you can see, you've got another line here for our application command. So when, without having to actually uh, specify anything, the transform detected the application command uh, during compilation of my project and added it as an application. And then when I add it to the class path of my actual project, it finds it and, and it all works. That's how it works. Yeah? OK. Uh, any other questions? Yeah? But the, is it actually implementing the application command that gives you access to the, to the app keeper? Because I know when we, I was trying to make a batch program data from our legacy app into this new one. Yeah. And we were starting with three. Yeah. And, you know, as we all know, there's very little help out there on three right now. Yeah. As it's, as it's so new. And I was trying to use some of the two methods to get access to the application configuration. You know, just because basically I was getting the error that I couldn't call this outside of a Grails app. Yeah. So, um... so we did it in Bootstrap, which we didn't really want to do. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, uh, application commands are designed so that. So the question is, is is, that, is application command the way to call integrals or yes, basically. from the yes. command line? Yes. Yeah, yeah. That is the way. Um, I had this demo working before. I, the earlier today, I've obviously right. made, made a syntax error. But essentially, um, yeah, you implement the application command interface, and as long as you set up your build a Gradle class path correctly, that command will automatically become a Gradle task. Okay. And well, what, what Grails does is it, it loads, um, it first loads Grails' application context, yeah? And then if you, if, if you look at this execution context object, um, it'll give you information about the command line and so you can read command line arguments. Uh, this API here will let you read the command line arguments that come in from the command line. Um, so, so if you did um, if you did Grails um, send batch email space to Fred, or you know something, you would you could get those arguments into your command and parse them. And you know. that's where we were stuck. So it was, yeah. we could create it, we just couldn't call it and get it to run, you know, with the app content. Yeah, right. So um, the application command has a, re a reference to the application context. So at that point. You can do, uh, I think it also has a reference to, no, it doesn't, in fact. It's probably a bit of an oversight, but uh, you can get the Grails application instance from the application context mm -hmm. by just doing application context of get bean uh, Grails application. 
probably like that, and that will give you a reference to the Rails application object. Um, but yeah, from, from the Spring context, you can get access to everything. And all it does is it loads up a headless version with no container, um, and you know you can you can you can execute GORM code statements in here. Um, if you do the if you do that, it's probably not a bad idea to implement uh, to wrap them in with transaction or or something to that effect. Um, and you can you know interact with any of your services and anything. That, yeah, that's where we were running into trouble. I couldn't no matter what I tried, I couldn't hook it to the application context to to get it to recognize it. It just yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is the way to do it. That is the solution we have. And uh, um, like it's, it's used in other places as well. So for example, um, if we go to uh, Grail's data mapping and we look for the Hibernate plugin sources, which are here. Uh, you'll see that there is a schema export command. Um, so you, when you do Grail schema export, you get the DDL file that you can import into your database. And you can see that this is a um, application command. Uh, it has a description. You can define a description and a name, and those get pop, uh, propagated into your um, uh, interactive mode help and so on. Um, and you can see what it does. It gets hold of reference to the command line, uh, use the execution context to get the target directory, which is build. Um, to, uh, it reads your command line arguments to work out what, what it should do. Uh, then it gets all the reference to the session factory, creates the Hibernate export, schema export object, um, and writes it out. So there's, uh, there's lots of examples of in the sources, obviously. Uh, we need to, to do a way better job of probably documenting this. Um, but there's lots of examples in the sources of this being used. Um, so yeah, that's how that, that, that this is how Grails is built, basically. <laughs> um, and the other one, the other example of that is in Grails core. Uh, there's another. There is a uh, URL mappings command or something. Command. URL mappings report command. This is a, another application command that prints out a report of your URL mappings. And it, again, it gets a reference to the URL mappings bean and uses our ANSI console reporter thing, Gizmo, and re renders your um, URL mappings so you can visualize what your URL mappings are. So again, another example that you, we needed the application context to be able to get that information uh, because you know, the, we could have recreated it manually by you know, just passing that one class, but the thing is it doesn't take into account at resource domain classes and certain other dynamically created aspects. So you really need the full application context to be able to correctly visualize your URL mappings. So that's uh, another example of that in action. Yeah. OK. Um, so Q&A is over. As I said before, um, the Grails team at OSI is growing. If you want to find out more, uh, right, and you know, if you want to work with a great team as well, just let us know. Uh, go to ociweb.com forward slash grails. You can find out all the information. Also, if you need help uh, upgrading your applications to Grails 3, if you have Grails 2 apps and you want to make the jump to Grails 3 and you, you need help getting there, we can help you. Uh, we would be super excited to work with you put, um, on projects like that, uh, we have a, uh, a large team of Grails developers who would be uh, delighted to assist in any way. So check us out on the web, uh, ociweb.com forward slash Grails. Also, stay connected. Uh, somebody mentioned at the start of my talk Slack. Um, does anybody use Slack or heard of Slack? Yeah. Quite a few hands. That's good. So. Um, yeah, Slack is uh, a you know a chat uh, interface, and it's great for communities because um, you can create channels and focused uh, discussions uh, around the framework. And um, we have a sign up page, so that's slack-signup.grails.org. And if you go there, 
uh, you can register. They've got native apps for iPhone and Android and um, Mac and probably other operating systems. I haven't tried the other ones. But um, it's pretty cool. And we have like 850 people or something close to. Uh, we had 800 last, last night during the keynote. And then I said, you know, we, went, we got 800 and come join us. And <laughs> another, another load of people came along. Uh, all those ones in the audience, I guess. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a great place to connect with the core team as well. We're we're always around, hanging out on there. So yeah, if you if you have a question or you know you get you get um, stuck on anything or you know there's a lot of folks out on there who will be happy to help. Uh, there's also Stack Overflow uh, for asking questions as well, um, which is another uh, nice thing about Stack Overflow is it's kind of searchable. So you've got a, like previous people who have encountered the same issue. You can kind of link questions. And it's also a great place to ask questions. And we're on Twitter. Uh, there's LinkedIn user groups. I think there's a Google Plus group as well. Uh, a whole bunch of places that you can connect with us, obviously, on the web. So yeah, stay connected. And yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um,